Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Lifestyle with Dr. Moby. And today we have uh, with me Carl as well as Dr. Kevin Payne. Hello, everyone. Hi. Hello. Okay, so let's welcome Dr. Kevin Payne all the way from Kansas City. And we were talking already that my Steelers are going to visit them in Arrowhead Stadium, and he's not going to be there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to watch it in the comfort of my own living room a few miles away from the stadium. Okay. And I was, if it wasn't COVID, I would have made to Red um, uh, Arrowhead. Yeah, but I, you know, I don't want to be ugly about this, but it would be so awful to travel all that way for such a disappointment. <laughs> yeah, that 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 can happen. <laughs> yeah. I, hey, you know, I, I understand. Look, for fifty years, you know, the Chiefs didn't win anything. Yeah. So, you know. Yeah. No, no. I mean, I I get it, but also it's uh, interesting that Steelers actually do better when they are away from their own stadium for some yeah, that's reason. true yeah. yeah and this season kansas city has done better away games than at home too so go figure yeah well we we wish you good luck <laughs> I, right. I hope for a great game yes whatever i mean i don't know if you <laughs> catch uh, if you got the last night game probably that was the best game of all <laughs> Between Charger and Vegas, I don't know. Carl, did you watch NFL? Too? I'm not a big a, a big fan, actually. I'm oh. more in. I'm more into the music scene than, than oh. anything else. But yeah, no problem, no problem. Okay, well, let's uh, carry out. I think uh, Dr. Kevin was telling me about a few things, and we talked a little bit. Uh, offline and that was first of all I, I wanted to ask him about his skydiving and he was t telling me that he started to give inner strength back get his inner strength back actually right yeah yeah for me it, it was something that that I'd wanted to do since I was a little kid and then I started the training in the 90s uh, to be a skydiver mm -hmm. and while I was working on my doctorate and couldn't do both of those at the same time. It turns out there's a lot more work involved in becoming a skydiver than you would think. It's not just falling to earth. So it requires a lot of time and effort. So career got in the way, kids got in the way, then health got in the way when I was diagnosed with MS and had some really nasty exacerbations and I gave up on the dream. And when I was at my lowest, I decided I was going to give myself one more shot to do something for myself mm -hmm. and try to regain some confidence that I'd lost due to all of the exacerbations over the years. Mm -hmm. So for me, that was, I'm going to become a skydiver. I'm going to fulfill that childhood dream. And you know, when you get diagnosed with MS, the first thing they say is avoid stress. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I want to cook the living snot out of every medical professional that ever gives that advice, because you can't avoid stress. Mm -hmm. you, you have to learn how to reframe stress. Mm -hmm. And there is good stress and bad stress, you stress and distress. And if you pull yourself back from the good stress, you know, from the bad stress, you pull yourself back from the good, stressful experiences in life, too. So for me, going back to skydiving was a life affirming sort of thing you know so do you get uh, when you do skydiving do you get the adrenaline rush right away it does that make you feel great yeah certainly your your acute stress response is is being tripped every time you do it and the first few times it's it's fearful right because uh, your yeah. basal brain is saying there is no good reason to be flinging your body out of a perfectly good airplane. Mm. And, and you do it anyway. So your, your little cave child inside is screaming on the way down. But once you do it a few times, it is amazing how adaptive humans are. And we can adapt to falling through the air at 120, 200 miles an hour. And it is amazing because after you do it for a while, it's not overwhelming. It's it's comfortable. 
and it's very mindful and you become very focused you know in this moment and your your senses become heightened and your sense of time since tends to elongate and and your reflexes quicken mm-hmm. and and now you see you're flying through the air and and you're you're tracking through the sky like iron man and it is such a cool experience yeah i i wish i could do it and i can do it because of my neck issues but otherwise i would have done so yeah. also tell me a little bit about uh, your phd you said uh, you did in uh, social psychology or data uh huh yeah i i specialize in two things mm-hmm. so one i'm a research methodologist and data scientist so i specialize in the how we study people and how we build mathematical and statistical models about people so mm-hmm. predicting uh why people are going to do one thing and not another and then the second thing that i've i've focused on in my career is the question why do some people succeed or fail when they're under distressing circumstances and so it turned out once i was diagnosed all that research i'd been doing on that general question really applied to well how do you build a good life when you are stuck with a health condition you can't get away from mm-hmm. so how do you so what was what are some of things which you have seen you know it's all about data and so mm-hmm. a little bit about so the data is also you know everything depends on what kind of data is coming through so right. if, if data is more what they have then it will also give that kind of theory so it's how inclusive that data would be right and and one of the things that that uh, i differed in my approach is is most of the research that's been done in this area is diagnosis specific so they're looking at ms patients or diabetes patients or cancer patients or whatever it is i wanted to take a little bit different approach i was interested in looking across diagnoses what is the experience of people trying to live with a condition they can't improve right mm-hmm. so and and what was interesting is so i i i interviewed hundreds i surveyed thousands i built a scraper that went out on the web and collected 2.23 million relevant data points looked at meta analyses across thousands of studies and what it turns out is when it comes to day-to-day concerns of living with a chronic illness less than 20% of the complaints that people were living with were directly medical most of them had to do with cognition and behavior and emotion and relationships and operation in the world you know much more practical experiential to kinds of questions that transcended a specific diagnosis so when i was building the book it was about speaking to the general experience of living with a condition that's probably not going to get better and and how do we change our mindsets and how do we change our behaviors and how do we adapt to a good life in the face of something bad hmm. what well, my other question on the same kind of topic is that since we talk about chronic condition and we talk about different diagnoses and across now there is also a spectrum a difference how different population react to Mm-hmm. so a lot of data is actually based on mostly uh whites you know and nothing right. is just because they 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 are more organized there was more organization and more data collection more education everything mm-hmm. and yes yeah, the so called weird hypothesis yeah uh, where and then there is nothing wrong but that's the truth the truth is that you know they they if you even go to any they even for my patients too you know a lot of mm-hmm. them uh, they show up on time and they are more care uh, they care more about their health in general 
and then they will be actually uh, coming to us and that, there's nothing wrong with that but the question is what happens to the other population and what mm -hmm. is the let's say for example ms you know so ms yeah. is more studied in that and then so what happens to the other and the data we have is that reflective of all and so if if there is an ms patient comes to me if it's a white ms then will have this kind of uh, problem if it's a black ms will have this kind of problem mm -hmm. if it's a asian and it'll be this kind of problem you know yeah so certainly and uh, well as a social and behavioral scientist one of the things i'm really concerned with is exactly the issue that you're talking about is representation and and true generalizability and and so you're absolutely right there are interaction effects that we see uh, between diagnosis and not just race and ethnicity, but also socioeconomic status and, and some of the other major demographic variables that we see. And, and so when we're, when we're parsing through those data, we've got to take culture into account, we've got to take social structure into account, we've mm -hmm. got to take access to resources and opportunities mm -hmm. into account. And you're absolutely right. There are people of color, uh, generally, who are underrepresented in all of those. And, and you know, I'm of the fan that they should be equally, then that data should be represented of that population more. So, for example, mm -hmm. COVID, you know, let's yeah. take example of COVID. Um, a COVID will affect mostly, uh, you know, uh, I mean, it can affect anyone, but for some reason it was affecting more um, colored people and they are dying more than, uh, you know, mm -hmm. than whites. And the reason, number one reason was health condition, actually. That's my opinion. Right. Um, yeah. You know, because, because they, they didn't take care of their health. I mean, if you look at the BMIs and, you know, there's kind of a little bit, cholesterol mm -hmm. level, diabetes, that was worse in uh, minorities. And, uh, you know, yeah, and the other thing is that uh, since we talk about BMI, so the BMI is uh, that number and that whole data was based on mostly white population. Right. And for me, this BMI of 25 would be disaster, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I... Don't get me started on BMI because I, I think it's I think it's a poor metric. Yeah. And and uh, you know there we should actually you know go to better numbers, better measures of 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 say body percentage of fat, um, you know cholesterol measures, yeah. all the things that are associated with BMI. But the BMI just kind of uh, hides because it's one number that that you can have many different body types and many different yeah. conditions that give you the same number. That is so true. It's, yeah, it's not really very useful. Like for me, uh, I I tend to be very lean, but I'm I'm fairly dense because I lift weights because yeah. I'm trying to do that to do everything I can to help get keep my MS you know at manageable right so yeah. i i will have a bmi that skews higher than what any of my other health indicators would tell you yeah you know? because i mean it includes your bone mass too mm -hmm. so so if you are your skeleton is bigger and you have more calcium sure you will be heavier you know right. versus so so it's like you're yeah, absolutely right so if you are uh, you know so it, it there is there is definitely incomplete so the whole idea of the, this is that you know don't go by just numbers just look at the whole thing you know so right. that's where i think the numbers mislead whatever they have data too that data also mislead because they all kind of uh, you know all the ai algorithms everything they go by okay let's see how many percentage are this okay we we shouldn't look there we shouldn't look there we shouldn't look there. i i i think that's where i see most of the problems are can be you know 
because well they, and and as somebody who's developed a lot of those algorithms over the years and you know I'm consulted for companies who are using these black box algorithms mm-hmm. and and they have no earthly understanding of the logic that is underlying the model and yeah. and so they have a really difficult time understanding what happens when it goes wrong and they do go wrong so uh, and, and, and you know the perfect example of ai and all these algorithms i say is the weather channel okay yeah so i i tell you, you know it's perfect so they will based on the previous year previous model how the wind is blowing they have all that fed into computer and they'll say okay your forecast tomorrow is going to be this 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 and many times it's accurate i'm not saying it's uh, but many times it's totally wrong too you know <laughs> so yeah it's, it's much better than it used to be but still significantly wrong and and that's one of the things that people have to keep in mind that all predictions are based on what's happened before hmm. so if you have that black swan event and and in complex systems we're going to have some kind of weird out of left field event that's going to happen sometimes then a model that is based on what's happened before by definition can't predict it and that's where the i think the problem is so uh, we we we're, we're still in learning i mean we are still perfecting <laughs> ai and i think it has to go a long way i mean it's nowhere near uh, you know where we can say okay you can drive car or you can do things with your eyes closed that's not going to happen well i still i yeah i still you know we've come a long way in the yeah. over 30 years that i've been involved in this kind of thing but mm-hmm. i i still would not call anything that's out there now intelligent yeah that's mm-hmm. that's that's being really really charitable and i would say i the only piggyback i do on that is that i say look at the fly you know which flies uh, you know bothers us or anything small insect it has more far more intelligence than a supercomputer <laughs> yeah i mean you cannot beat that you cannot beat that uh, so well, it, <laughs> there there was just a, a a recent study i think posted by a team out of MIT Mm. where they had compared neural nets and then they had taken uh cultures of human brain cells in a dish and they had they'd used both of them as the engine to to learn how to play pong the old video game and the lump of human cells in a dish learned faster than the best ai they could put at it go ahead that just came out a couple of weeks ago yeah i know i was uh, just amazing you know uh, i mean a weekend even beat covid forget about <laughs> so yeah. he, you know so that we got all kind of uh, and that's where i think but good thing is that we have to do a lot of research into it and we keep learning and i think you're absolutely right we have progressed a lot but we have a long way to go strictly long way to and a lot of learning which is great i mean i don't think we are afraid of learning but but uh, oh no that's that's yeah. learning is an edge and and all the good things happen at the edge and and that's uh, and that's i think that's one of the things that has has caused a lot of the problem with the public accepting their understanding of covid right now mm-hmm. and that is if we do science we know science is messy mm-hmm. and and science is kind of ugly and science has a lot of mistakes and a lot of dead ends and and we we keep working at it and the public which is not used to that version of science has kind of seen behind the curtain a little bit and and without having the the context for understanding no that's how science gets to a better answer it's it's not a neat process and and so i think that has contributed to a lot of people's apprehension 
about the science surrounding COVID. Mm, and that is true. And I think so I also want to ask you about your uh, being author. I know you talk a little bit about your book. Uh, so tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, this is it's it's called Your Life Lived Well. And the subtitle is The Science of Crafting a Good Life Under Chronic Distress, Pain and Illness. And so what I was interested in were I was interested in all of the non-medical consequences that follow from living with a condition that's not going to get better. And because we all know that if you get a diagnosis like multiple sclerosis or cancer or diabetes or whatever it is, there's 150 common chronic illnesses and 7,000 rare chronic conditions. Mm -hmm. And and we all know that it's it, it may start with a short list of medical signs and symptoms, but it very rapidly spreads into every aspect of your life. Mm -hmm. And it changes the way you think and the way you feel and the way you act and the way other people feel about you and, and all of those things. So I was interested in not talking about improving health, but improving quality of life. And so if we have this bad thing, what can we do cognitively, behaviorally, socially to improve that net quality of life that we're going to experience? So that's what the book is focused on. And, and then in between the substantive chapters, I tell my story with mm -hmm. MS. And, and for several years, I was a caregiver to a wife with, a, with a, a, an advanced case of cancer. And, and so... You know, my life has been turned upside down by chronic illness, both being one diagnosed and as a caregiver. So I, I had to kind of tell my story in there, too, so that people understood this isn't just about some scientist guy talking at you. It's about, you know, a guy who's lived it as well. Oh, well, that is uh, the human touch, you know, that is probably mm -hmm. makes us uh, different, feel differently that, you know, because you're going through plus uh, you can feel, you know, what things matter or what things really made a difference, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know. And, right, right. And and for me, my my approach isn't trying to push a particular solution on people because we all know that well you know for the most part adapting to life with a chronic illness amounts to managing successful mindset and behavior change mm -hmm. and and they're like 150 ways to change a behavior and mm -hmm. all of them work for someone but only some of them will work for you yeah and and the ones that work for you now won't work for you in six months or six years so in the book, I'm not interested in pushing one way or another. I'm interested in teaching people how to understand themselves well enough that they can chart their own course. And that is a beautiful thing about it. So tell me, uh, Carl, do you have a question for Dr. Kevin? Uh, no, I, I kind of like the, I kind of like this conversation. Um, it's you can ask him about music. You can <laughs> ask him about music. He loves music. He told yeah. me. So tell me, <laughs> doctor, about your music because Kevin will be very interested in knowing that. Yeah, if you will. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I grew up musical. My <clears throat> my mom's a is a pianist. Mm -hmm. And so from the time I was little, I started uh, you know, I was I, I was sat down at the piano before I could walk and and started playing there and then i picked up the trombone a few years later and i'm in kansas city so uh played in jazz bands blues bands for years and this the trombone behind me that's a uh, 1941 liberty 2b which is a great jazz horn and and so uh you know i did that and picked up the guitar and and i just you know i, I love playing music playing music is one of it's one of the most human things we do have you have you found uh, that music actually it um 
I guess for me, like when I'm feeling sick or whatever, it kind of does lift my soul. I mean, because I'm a, I'm yeah. I'm, a, I'm a singer by trade, and mm-hmm. um, it kind I mean, I have my own channel and everything, and and I perform. I I become a different person if that makes mm-hmm. sense. I mean, the way yes, I totally. I mean, the way I speak is not is not the way I sing, because sure. there's something. I I've heard that that the way people perform if they're musicians, it does something in the brain, if that makes sense. Yeah, so it, it there's rewires, another part. Yeah, yeah, it definitely rewires your brain. And for me, it's also an important therapy because I have I have difficulty getting my hands to work sometimes. Yeah. So like some days I I can't play the guitar or the trombone or the piano. You know, I just, I I can't get it to work, but I do every day that I possibly can because I'm, I'm trying to preserve as much fine motor skill as Mm -hmm. I can. And, and it helps keep those, those neural connections between my, uh, you know, how I'm thinking and processing with, my my motor skills as well so yeah. it's 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 really crucial to do that it's it's almost as important as you know like skydiving for me skydiving for me is therapy and and uh, it's it's really crucial when we live with a chronic illness it's easy to start saying goodbye to the things that we love about our lives and those are the things that we have to work hardest to protect because those are the things that give us our sense of identity and accomplishment and make us feel connected and and valuable in the world and that, that's a beautiful thing there are two things Carl. i would like to emphasize i just give example for yeah uh, because i'm in medicine i can tell you a little bit so you know people who have let's say who have stroke and they they get paralysis of their face okay which mm-hmm. is special nerve and that get paralyzed what we have seen is that many times for most of emotions their face could be paralyzed partly but if they smile those nerve connections find a way and it is working yeah. Mm-hmm. So when you say that, when you are singing, you're totally different how you talk or say things. And I've seen him. By the way, he's an excellent singer. If you haven't heard him, if you listen to his voice and all that, you say, wow, Carl, it's just amazing. So, And I told him he'll be one of the biggest singers I have ever known. He's, he's, he's gifted. So, But I, I will say that. This is what brain does. Brain is so magical that it has mm-hmm. so many powers that you you think that it doesn't exist. But we are surprised many times I have walked to patient and we are doing CPR 45 minutes, 72 minutes, whatever. And we think he'll never, he or she will never make next day. And to my biggest surprise, next day they're smiling and like nothing ever happened. So... I mean, we get stunned. We see miracles. People say miracles. Well, I say I see miracles every day in my job because we 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 look at uh, we say, oh my God, how could that happen? I mean, data would wouldn't say that. Okay, data wouldn't say the moment you go forty minutes, fifty minutes without oxygen, you're pretty much gone. So mm-hmm. then, but you know, they have zero damage, zero zero damage. So, but then, so that what is important is that pay attention to the current. Everybody's different. Everybody's human. Everybody has a different needs, and everybody is uh, unique. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I'll yeah, give yeah. you another for instance yeah, that's that's amazing. Um, neuroplasticity is our friend. Yeah. One of the things that that happened with my MS is I generally. I, for several years there, I had no feeling in my legs below my knees. I mean, so much so that I once stepped on a two-inch shard of glass, embedded it completely in my foot, walked through the house, and didn't even notice 
until my little kids were screaming at me that I was leaving bloody footprints everywhere. Wow. After more than a year, about a year and a half of skydiving all the time, I had been working so hard at trying to get any kind of feeling I could in my life, you know, understanding where my legs were in free fall. Because if you, if you have them out of balance, you start spinning around and tumbling and yeah. it's it really yeah. ugly, really fast. Mm. So I was, I was spending so much time focusing on my legs that now I have some feeling in my lower legs. It still feels noisy. It's maybe 20% feeling, but it's more than it was. Wow. And Amazing. So see that this got, in my opinion, that is miracle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that is miracle. I, ne I never thought I was going to be able to feel my feet again. Yeah. So that's about it. So, mm -hmm. see, but if, if that's the whole idea is that if we give up, if we think that, uh, you know, it doesn't, but, you know, you, you worked for it, you took it, you know, to the next level and you found a way. Well, that's all. all we oh, I, oh, I have a question, uh, Dr. Payne. Uh, how do you, how do you, uh, God in the equation of, of the research? And, you know, how do, you know I, I'm sorry. Can you, yeah. Can how, you how, that? yeah. How do you put God in, you know, the middle of all this? In your calculation. I think, I think that is an individual's decision. I, I'll tell you what I think I can say. Yeah. As a scientist, mm -hmm. I can say that meaning is important. I can say that awe is important. I can say that feeling connected and and transcendent, mm. you know, there is there is a there is an awesome feeling of transcendence in a skydive. Mm. You feel at once so small and so large at the same time. Mm -hmm. And and there is there is one thing that we do when we skydive that I can only explain in religious terms. Mm -hmm. And that is when we're falling belly to earth, you know, like this, we're going about 120 miles an hour. When we then sweep our arms back and extend our legs so we look like Iron Man flying through the sky, you accelerate from about 120 miles an hour to about 200 miles an hour. Wow. In a second. And and it feels like because you just you just hit this groove and you suddenly shoot forward through the sky. And it feels like the only way I can describe it is like the hand of God just picks you up and pushes you through the sky. And it is an amazing, awesome, humbling experience. That's awesome. Uh, so doctor, I, I, uh, Doctor Obi, I gotta get going. Um, uh, no problem, no problem. Okay. We'll carry out that, but we are almost at the end, anyways. Yeah. Thank you, Carl. Okay. I'm, I'm and so it. glad you made it, Carl. Yes, thank you, Doctor Payne. I will be in touch soon. Okay. Yeah. Take you. care, Carl. Feel better. Bye bye. Bye. Okay. So, uh, thank you for coming to our show. And so, any final message you have for our viewers? You know, I, 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 I just want to reemphasize that half of all Americans now are living with at least one chronic condition. 18% mm -hmm. of us have five or more diagnoses. Mm -hmm. And being sick with a chronic illness is not like breaking an arm or, or having the flu or something like that. And it is normal. And the more that we can speak up and the more that we can normalize good lives, even when we have a diagnosis, the better all of us are going to be. And that's uh, important thing is to, like you said, to take care, know your body and mm -hmm. understand that you are unique and then uh, make sure you take care of your health. 
So that yes. is the basic message. And, uh, you know, don't be bothered by even if you have, um, that's my, my philosophy, even yes, you could have many diagnoses, that's true. But look at the main thing. Main thing is the reason we have so many diagnoses, we are not taking care of our health. So yeah. look at the main message here, not just BMI, but your cholesterol, your overall health. So if you well, can... And yeah, and I argue that once you have a chronic diagnosis, so many people want to just pull back from life. And, and I argue that it is even more critical that you do everything you possibly can to be as healthy as you can in every other way. And that is true. And so if you fix that, uh, 10 other diagnoses will disappear, believe me. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is uh, my personal too. And uh, because your blood pressure, sleep apnea, diabetes, cholesterol, all mm -hmm. will relate it to your uh, not eating better and not eating right. healthier and not taking care of yourself. So if you, if you are... And I think there is a very nice quote which I ha which I have seen, and I would like to share with uh, someone, and which is actually a really unique. And I thought that is I've not seen that for many many. It said the cost of not following your heart is spending the rest of your life wishing you had. Yeah, that's about it. <laughs> that's as simple yeah. as it can. Yeah, and, and that's something that the data actually do support from retrospective studies of, of the elderly. Yeah, so for with that, uh, I would say thank you for coming and it was a pleasure knowing you and good luck to your cancer chief. <laughs> <laughs> and good luck to your Steelers too. Okay, you take care. Take care. Take care. Thanks take care. again.